Good morning, everybody, and welcome to, on behalf of the Leeds Anchor Network, welcome to this Diversity Data Roundtable. Uh, my name is Richard Emmert. Uh, I'm Director of Corporate Affairs at Yorkshire Water. I've been working with colleagues here at, the, uh, at ODI Leeds uh, to organize and host this event uh, today. I'd also like to start by thanking uh, Andy Dobman and uh, Sue Wynn from Leeds City Council, uh, both for organizing the, uh, and, and coordinating the Leeds Anchor Network and all the contribution that it brings and also their help in supporting and facilitating what we're about to do today. I hope you've had a chance to look through the agenda and I hope that you think that you're in for a stimulating, interesting, an enjoyable morning. We have a really interesting group of speakers, uh, mostly with pre-recorded content, and there will be opportunities for Q&A uh, at the end of most of the sessions. However, more than just being interesting, stimulating, and useful, uh, I really hope that we end today with something that is practical, useful, and will make a difference. I was sat there yesterday with my colleague uh, trying to work out uh, how we could construct a press release to talk about today's uh, round table. Uh, and uh, I was chatting to my colleague, who I hope is on this call, and uh, he's one of the most uh, insightful uh, and articulate writers I've worked with. And we were both slightly struggling to communicate what we were trying to achieve today. And it was quite interesting, because had we been setting out uh, to draft a press release sort of condemning discrimination in the workplace in all shapes or forms and saying it had no place in any of our operations, we'd have probably been able to do that in about five minutes. However, what we're trying to set out here is something that's much more important than that, much more complex than that, uh, and has the potential to make a great difference. Very simply, what we're setting out to do in the course of today is to commit ourselves to creating the opportunity for all of us all the big employers in Leeds, uh, uh, totaling approximately 58,000 employees, all to publish their diversity data on the same basis, so that we can then work out where the problems are in, our rep in the representation of our workforce, and more crucially, what it is we might be able to do about it. We'll be the first city in the UK, I believe, to do something like this. Uh, I've not actually been able to find another city uh, elsewhere in the world that's, that where, where employers have collaborated voluntarily in this sort of way without some sort of government sanction. So I think this is a really important event uh, and it's a very powerful uh, demonstration of what the Anchors Network is all about. Big employers working collaboratively to generate inclusive growth. So that's the end of my introduction. We'll now move into some of the, uh, the content uh, which we've pre-recorded. So first of that will be uh, Councillor Pryor on behalf of Leeds City Council uh, giving you a welcome to the event on behalf of the council. And then we move into a longer case study uh, from Trevor Phillips and, uh, and Richard Weber, talking about why diversity data matters and sharing with you an example how the, of how the Royal Free Hospital in London has assembled its uh, own diversity data and what it's done about it. So I hope you enjoy the, the day. Keep the questions flowing through on the chat function uh, throughout the speakers. And then at the end of the first two speakers, we'll come back uh, to a live Q&A with Trevor uh, and deal with some of those questions. So, over to uh, Councillor Pryor. As the Executive Member for Learning, Skills, Employment and Equality uh, at Leeds City Council, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this roundtable event today. I am, of course, um, coming to you from uh, my spare room, as is completely on brand for, for 2020. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank you, send a thank you to Richard Emmett at Yorkshire Water for organising the event and Leeds Open Data Institute for hosting the meeting. I'm really proud that Leeds is leading the way in developing a place-based partnership approach through the Leeds Anchors Network with practical actions that will support the achievement of the city's ambitions on inclusive growth and the health and well-being of all its citizens. But as movements like Black Lives Matter have shown, there is much more yet to do. This partnership comprising 12 anchor institutions with over 58,000 employees, and that's one in every six employees in the city, with an annual expenditure in excess of two billion pounds provides an important opportunity to unlock the potential for transformational change and outcomes to address inequalities in the city. The work led by the network's HR directors with a focus on employment policy and practice will, I hope, 
support Leeds to become the best city to work in. We've already put in place programmes that demonstrate Leeds is a city that invests in talent and supports progression with award-winning employability and apprenticeship programmes to increase social mobility, pay the living wage and support the wider economy through levy transfers. The roundtable today will be the start of a journey to demonstrate that we are a city committed to workforce equality and diversity, evidenced by sharing our collaborative work on gender and ethnicity pay gap reporting and the joint actions that flow from this. Leeds City Council is committed to action in this area and will play its part in contributing to the network's ambition to develop a city workforce diversity dashboard and that will ensure that as a public service body we reflect the communities we serve and that employment opportunities with the largest employers in the city are open and accessible to our citizens. The opportunity to embed this approach across the network and support will encourage others to do so and it has the potential to leverage real change. Thank you. Hello, my name is Trevor Phillips. I'm half of the data analytics consultancy Weber Phillips. And first I'd like to thank Richard Emmett and colleagues at uh, Yorkshire Water for arranging this important round table. Fairness is the issue of our time, and we've seen that in the streets and in our workplaces. But one of the questions that I think people are constantly asking themselves is, how do we know that things are fair? And at the heart of that is having good, comprehensive data. But of course, data is not much good by itself. We need to separate the signal from the noise. That is to say, we can have oodles of data, lots of spreadsheets, but we need to understand what is important, uh, how we separate one category of person from another and how we compare them. Our work at Weber Phillips is designed principally to try to understand the signal about different ethnic and racial and linguistic groups compared to each other, to look at large amounts of data and to try to understand what they tell us about the differing outcomes and preferences and behaviours of those different groups. What we want to do is to make sure that we have better, more comprehensive data that our analysis provides for a purer signal. And what we do, we do for local authorities, for blue light services, for retail and consumer groups, and we do that, this for finance companies, banks and so forth, as well as particularly sports and cultural organisations who want to know more about who they employ, who works in their sector, and of course, who their audiences are. So we've learned a lot over the years about this kind of issue. We've applied it particularly in recent times to thinking about health. And I'll come to COVID in a second, as it's a great illustration of why we need to understand the difference between signal and noise. And my colleague, uh, Professor Richard Weber, will in a moment give you a case study, which I think illustrates that in detail and very vividly. But in the last couple of decades, we've seen really great examples of why having better data and better understanding of the data helps us to find the right remedies. Three quick examples. In the 90s, a medical researcher who happened to be of Asian origin was able to show that the different way in which Asian families uh, put their infants to sleep uh, led to a fall or a reduction in the incidence of cot deaths. And that learning was able to reduce the incidence of cot deaths in Britain by well over a half. We did some work with Dr. Foster about 15 years ago, uh, which was able to show that the reasons that some groups used accident in emergency services more than uh, the average was cultural and that that behavior was, was changeable. And as a consequence, 
not only were there better outcomes for that group, but there were great savings uh, for some uh, health authorities where there was an overuse of accidents and emergency. That is to say, people were taking their children, for example, into hospitals when they could have gone to their local GP. And in the last couple of years, we've done some work for Prostate Cancer UK, in which we were able to identify the clusters of particularly vulnerable groups, specifically men of African Caribbean origin, who are twice as likely to suffer or be uh, killed by prostate cancer uh, as the average. And we were able to identify uh, the groups and the locations for uh, those clusters, which helped prostate cancer to communicate more directly and more specifically and in a way that was more appropriate for those groups. So these issues are extremely important. What Richard will, I think, show in his uh, example is two specific things that may be of interest to those on this call in this meeting. First of all, the importance of granularity, particularly when it comes to ethnicity. 25 years ago, when we looked at results for children in schools, we would tabulate them by three or at most four groups, white, black, Asian, everybody else. As a consequence, we made no distinction, for example, between people of Indian heritage and those of Pakistani heritage. When we were able to collect data on a more granular basis, what we were able to show, and it changed almost everything actually about the way we dealt with this specific issue, uh, was that those of Indian heritage were outperforming the average by well over 20%, whilst those of Pakistani Muslim heritage were underperforming the average by something like 10 or 15%. Why did this matter? Well, because the earlier diagnosis suggested that the problems lay in almost entirely the attitudes of teachers. The more detailed and granular diagnosis showed that we had a lot of work to do, not just with teaching the teaching profession, but also with families, and also with understanding the attitudes to education uh, amongst different, but rather similar groups. The other thing that we think is important is understanding the trend data uh, between ethnic groups. And this brings us particularly to COVID, where it is widely supposed that uh, there is a difference between uh, those who are white and those who are not white. Well, we think that that is probably true, but we also believe that it doesn't tell us very much. And there are four things it specifically doesn't tell us. First of all, who is actually uh, being impacted more? Uh, it is not enough to say that those who are not white are being more impacted. Do we think that the Caribbean, people of Caribbean heritage like myself, have the same level of risk as those of African background? Well, on the basis of almost everything else that we know, age profiles, occupational profiles, that is really unlikely. Uh, but many of the studies, most of the studies that have been done on this front, don't actually make a uh, distinction between those two groups. And therefore, we don't know enough. Secondly, we don't know where the gaps are. Are they to do with infection? Are they to do with hospitalization? Are they to do with mortality? Uh, we need more detail on all of that. Thirdly, we don't know much about the when. At the start of the uh, pandemic in February, March, it seemed clear that there was a distinct difference between, uh, diff between so-called BAME groups and white groups. Now, four or five months later, Actually, much of the data that we have doesn't tell us quite that, and we don't know what the situation is overall. But time, we think, the trend may make quite a distinct difference to our understanding of this problem. And fourthly, we don't know much about why. It is widely supposed that there is an occupational uh, differential, but we don't know enough. We think at Weber Phillips that, for example, that uh, those who work in social care uh, and in some parts of uh, healthcare, the healthcare system, uh, for example, geriatrics, are more at risk. And if you were to look at the occupational profile, what you would find is, for example, that people of Filipino background are probably 
way more exposed, if that is true, than the average. At the moment, we don't have that data. These are just examples of the reason that we think it is absolutely crucial to combine all the data sets, data sets we have for different data holders to be able to talk to each other and to interrogate the kinds of information they have uh, so that in the end, what we have is more data, but we have more good and intelligible data that allows us to separate the signal from the noise. I now hand over to Richard uh, to take you through a case study that I think illuminates uh, many of these points. Thank you. So, good morning. My name is Richard Weber, and I'm a colleague of Trevor Phillips. Our organization, Weber Phillips, helps our clients better measure the diversity of neighborhoods, of clients, and of staff. And we use technology which infers people's heritage from their personal and their family names. Now, though it is by now quite an old piece of work, I wanted to share with you an analysis of staff diversity, which we did at the Royal Free Hospital in London using this technology, because I think it is a good example of how it can be used to look at staff. And I understand that that is of interest to many of you, which is why you're joining this seminar today. So in some environments, such as business, we tend to justify diversity on grounds of fairness or maximizing the use of talent. And important though these may be in a hospital, a key concern there is whether when they visit a hospital, patients encounter at least some staff who look a bit like themselves. So here we have a table which shows uh, by a number of different ethnic groupings, uh, the percentage of staff, which is the first numerical column, the percentage of patients, um, and also the percentage of residents um, in the area served by that hospital. And on the right in red, you can see two columns. First one showing how the staff are similar to or different from the patients. And the one on the far right shows you how typical the staff are of residents within the catchment area. And very quickly within this table, uh, we can see not only that the staff are very diverse, but there are some ethnic groups are particularly more likely to be staff members than they are to be patients. So if we took a look at top with black Africans, there are three times as many uh, black Africans on the staff of the Royal Free Hospital um, than there are patients by comparison. And when we look down the bottom, we find that Greek and Greek Cypriot and Jewish and Armenian patients use the hospital, but they tend not to find people of a similar ethnicity on the staff. Now, one of the things that Trevor and I find particularly frustrating um, is how limited our understanding is of some fine differences uh, within different ethnic groups. And I think it's a common limitation of many white people that they think that all Muslims are fairly similar or all South Asians are fairly similar when they're not. And this table breaks down the categories of staff in a bit more detail. And you can see that, for example, uh, within the uh, South Asian community, Sri Lankan Tamils and Indian Sikhs are particularly likely to be working in the hospital compared with patients, uh, whereas Bangladeshis and Somalis come in as patients, but they very seldom see people from that ethnic group. So that's a range of 10 to 1 between 2.92 on the first uh, red column and 0.27 at the bottom with Somalis. And I think this does illustrate how important it is to try to get down below the level of classification uh, which the ONS and our government tend mostly to use and which is the standard uh, classification system used in many hospitals. Now another uh, limitation I think of many of these analyses is that we tend to want to focus on the diversity of the organisation as a whole and not the diversity of individual departments or job functions. Department in which different employees work and we've organized these categories from left to right so that the categories on the left tend to be ones which have a very high proportion of white British staff 
and on the right uh, occupations which tend to rely particularly on non-white British. So you can see on the left hand side if you look at the category allied health professionals and I'm not entirely sure what they mean. Um, you can see 68% of these are white British, whereas if we look at additional clinical services, this is the most diverse uh, group uh, with only 37% uh, white British. But when we look at the different minorities, we can see enormous differences as to what departments they work in. So estates and ancillary attract the um, Hispanics, uh, Africans particularly work in additional clinical services, nursing and midwifery tend to be specialities of Hispanics and professional scientific and technical services, South Asians and Muslims. And I'm sure you will find equally large differences in, in your own organisation. Another way of looking at that is to see what are the roles that people from different minorities tend to uh, take. So here we see Anglo-Saxons tend to be the senior managers, the physiotherapists and the occupational therapists. Eastern Europeans work at the bottom as healthcare assistants in the medical laboratories. Uh, Hispanics as staff nurses and healthcare assistants. Um, and South Asians usually are found um, in finance departments or as registrars, but also in hospitals as specialty and trust grade doctors. Now, one of the uh, problems that many people have is they think they have a problem recruiting uh, members of particular minority groups. Whereas in practice, often the problem that they have is recruiting uh, people from particular genders within those groups. So here what we've got is a split of each of these main groups by gender, uh, red being female and blue being male. So if we look at people who work in the hospital with a Slavic background, they're almost 80% uh, four-fifths female. Whereas when you look at Muslim workers, that's the group where the female um, members of that community are the least likely to be working in the hospital. So we don't quite know whether they don't like working in the hospital for some reason or other, whether the hospital has not been particularly effective in trying to recruit them. But that's an issue that needs to be looked at. And it's so important, in my opinion, to look at this intersectionality between gender and community. Now, also, uh, because we've obviously got the, the age of the employees, we thought it would be useful to look at how the mix between the white British and non-white British varies uh, by age group. And generally speaking, we can see um, that the younger the worker, the less likely they are to be white British. And this tends to reflect uh, the start dates and also the waves of recruitment. Um, so we have both the age of the staff member um, and also the length of service. And both of these actually tell us interesting stories. And you can see from this chart in particular how from 1996 onwards, the hospital started to recruit many more people from non-white British communities. That reached its peak in about 2001 to 2005 and has been relatively stable um, any, ever since. And I thought it was interesting to put some of these uh, different uh, groupings on the chart to show the waves. So with Hispanics, many of whom are Filipinos, we can see there was a big wave around about 2001 to 5, but that's dropped down subsequently. And we can see a very big increase in the proportion of Muslim uh, recruits. Uh, that's the uh, purple line. Um, from 1980, where they were particularly unlikely to want to work in the hospital, to 2009, where actually out of those four groups, um, they are the largest. And then the final thing that we thought would be useful to do is because we know the postcodes of where staff live, uh, we can make a map. Uh, the hospital is really in the middle of that red area down the southeast corner of the map. You can see Highgate and Hampstead perhaps if you've got good eyesight. But the staff are recruited very much along a corridor of North London. They're not recruited around um, orbitally. That may be different now with the new electrification of lines in North London. 
But I think a map such as this is very helpful because if we know where the staff live, I think we can also work out where um, people who are not staff live and we can see whether the excess staff in particular minorities reflects the communities that actually live in the catchment area of the hospital from the point of view of recruitment. And what I haven't done, but maybe I should have done, is to show you how within that catchment area uh, there are certain minorities that are particularly likely to work in the hospital and others that it doesn't seem to find it so easy to recruit. So that's my little uh, story to you. And just to finish off perhaps with some of the features of name-based classifications that enabled us to do what we did here. First of all, we do get 100% of coverage. So there's no non-response to the ethnicity question. The second one, you saw uh, Somalis and Sri Lankans. We have much more detailed category. And particularly in a hospital, there are very, very big differences between categories that we think otherwise are fairly similar. It's non-intrusive, so you don't have to uh, ask people questions. It's not a lot of work to find out what category people belong to, because all of that can be done by the computer. We can also be consistent in the sense that we can go back over 30 or 40 years and look at historic patterns, or we can look at people who have applied who haven't necessarily been uh, given a job. So it is both retrospective and prospective. And perhaps I think the most important moral we've learned from um, the study um, is that it's no use taking a snapshot. We need to take a video and see how things are changing over time and whether our policies are, or strategies are actually being effective in practice. So thank you very much for your attention. And I now hand you to, um, on to the next part of your seminar. Okay, you are live. Well, uh, good morning again, everybody. Hopefully you found that set, the, those first two sessions uh, really interesting and, and have given us some food for thought. Uh, so keep the questions coming through on the chat function. Uh, to uh, uh, I'm, I'm joined here by, uh, by Trevor Phillips and uh, between us, we'll do our best to answer them. I guess my first question, uh, I'll take uh, first dibs if I may, Trevor, um, and, and ask you, I guess, based on what you know about what our aspiration is of trying to get all the big employers in a, in a city to collaborate in the publication of data, what do you think are the sort of issues that we'll need to overcome when we're working together to kind of to, to do this? Uh, forgive me, Richard, are we actually on? We are live, yes. Right, okay. So, sorry, I've obviously, uh, my technology is slightly baffled me. Um, I, th I think the main obstacles, I mean, there are obviously got always going to be technical obstacles, which are to do with, you know, what the, the geeks would call interoperability and so on. There will be issues about how you uh, manage and categorize data. But I, I would say that the, the principal um, issues that one has to deal with are essentially ones of trust and purpose. Um, and in a way, I think those two things are, uh, are connected. Uh, I, I think that if everybody can agree what the purpose of collecting or using or sharing data is, then it becomes easier to trust. I mean, to put it simply, uh, in our everyday lives, um, you, you know, we, we work with people who we think have similar ambitions and uh, and so on to ourselves. And we're much more prepared to trust somebody who we know want to achieve the same thing. So I, I would have said that the, the first and the most important thing for everybody who's trying to, who's involved in this kind of exercise is to ensure that we've got a common idea of what the outcome is. And if we can be clear about that, I think that the trust barrier actually comes down very quickly. Mm. Yes, yes, I'm sure that's right. Um, and I think there's also a slight, a slight reticence, I think you'll find it, well, certainly we found with, uh, with some employers in that uh, if your data isn't perfect, you're not very keen to share it. 
<laughs> and I know this from our own workforce uh, diversity data. My colleague Jill Mason will will talk about this a little later on. So when we talk about our own uh, diversity reporting, clearly we've got very compelling and um, complete data as far as gender is concerned. Our data on ethnicity uh, is not bad. There are some gaps. There's about a nine percent non-declaration gap, which we'll we'll talk about later. Um, but our data on all the other protected grounds, disability, for instance, is terrible. Um, so that sometimes makes you a bit reluctant to kind of share that data publicly because you're slightly embarrassed about the fact that you're not good at it. However, there's, there is a, I think it's important to find ways to overcome that sort of reticence on the basis that other people that might actually have, uh, have found ways to get better data. And if you're open and share it, then presumably you might tease out some improvements that you didn't know about. It's almost like crowd. That's absolutely. Solutions. Sorry. It's almost like I, I think that's absolutely sorry. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, and in a way, uh, what you're describing is something that all of us suffer from, which is what I think I would call old school thinking. That is to say, I've got my homework and I'm going to, you know, cover it and nobody must ever look at my exercise book because they might get an answer that I can't get. Well, of course, one of the the, the things that we have been learning in the last um, 10 years since the advent of what people call big data is that actually th this whole idea that there is a single answer and there is a single truth, especially when we're thinking about things like, um, uh, you know, diversity data, the behaviours of different groups and so on, uh, just doesn't correspond to reality. Big data is messy, it's, it's imprecise, and actually that's part of its value. We have lots and lots of data that tell us that not just what is most likely to be true, but also where the uncertainties are. And uh, I think everybody who deals with uh, data at this level now realizes that actually the more we have and the more sources we have, the better it is for everybody. There is no prospect of perfection there is no possibility or, in fact, desirability of a single answer. And that, therefore, the, the combined data actually benefits everybody. I mean, in economics, they now call it non -rival, a non-rival good. Um, that is to say, once one person's used it, it's not used up. Every, you can get more and more use out of more data. So I think, actually, the, the view that's being taken now is that the more we cooperate, the more we get out of the whole exercise. Um, and actually, as you say, not only do we learn what other people do, but we gain insights actually that we wouldn't have by ourselves. And one of the things that we find, we've got you know, dozens of clients in private, public and, and, and um, third sectors, is that almost every time we talk to somebody about the way they use our data sets or our technology, we're discovering something new that we ourselves didn't think we knew how to do. So two years ago, we didn't, uh, for, for the data scientists and on the call, we, we didn't really do much in relation to um, combining ethnicity data with geographical data. But actually doing some work for local authorities particularly showed us that in fact, there's some fascinating insights to be gained by doing that. One, for example, being that people from um, different ethnic back or a particular ethnic background behave quite differently depending on whether they live in a geography where there are a lot of them uh, or an area in which they are, you know, uh, not concentrated. So, you know, people of Indian Hindu background vote rather differently if they live in a concentration than if uh, you know, of, of people like themselves compared to what they might do in areas where there are fewer. Uh, and that's actually been for particularly our, um, our clients in political parties, that's actually been an extremely valuable and revealing insight. Thank you for that. Um, we've had a question come through, perhaps not surprisingly, your comments about COVID uh, have attracted uh, a lot of interest. We have some of the most significant members of the Leeds Anchor Network are healthcare providers, as, as you might expect. Uh, and the question that's come through, I, th I think, speaks back to your point about the granularity uh, issue. Uh, and the question is, is the expression or the classification of BAME useful or not 
uh, when you're looking at COVID incident and impact? I suspect I know you're well, this. Yeah, I think we can, we can now say, and I probably wouldn't have said it this conclusively four months ago, but I think we can now say pretty conclusive, it's not only is it not very useful, it's actually misleading. Um, and um, in some ways, I think we will find at the end of this uh, process that the um, use of these large categories has actually been actively unhelpful to dealing with COVID. One of the things that we already know, uh, and we're pretty certain about, um, I mean, there are a lot of things we don't know. We don't know if the difference, difference between ethnic groups occurs at infection or hospitalization or mortality. We don't know to what extent uh, occupation um, ethnicity is in this case a, a proxy for occupation and so on. We don't know those things. But what we do know is that there are some differences. And what's been clear um, as we've gathered more data is that whatever the truth about what I've just said is, that there are differences within large ethnic groups. So for example, there are quite significant differences. And when I say significant, I mean a multiple of two or three, uh, two, one to 200 percent between somebody like me of direct of Caribbean background compared to, as it were, my cousins of African background uh, who didn't go the long, come here the long way round. Now, we don't know why that is. Um, we can't explain it. There's work going on. We'll probably get some ideas in about a year or two's time. But actually, the problem, the truth is we don't need to know. What we need to know is that actually I, in this case, am at greater risk than my um, African cousin, and that in practice, what should probably have happened is that I should have been instructed to um, uh, I should have been instructed uh, to, to shield several months ago. Now that's why this issue of granularity is so important because you could pick out similar examples. And another one I, I think I may have mentioned is a position of Filipinos uh, and Filipino nurses, who by and large, by the way, we don't pick up in the normal ethnicity statistics. In our work we do because uh, we, we have a system that allows for granularity up to 20 or 50 categories. Uh, but if you want to identify small groups like Filipinos or Nepalese and so on, I think that's gonna be very, very important in, in COVID because I think we'll find not only is there a differential impact in these small groups, but actually some of the outbreaks are to do with what has happened, and I'm not stigmatizing any group, but what has happened or the situation of particularly small groups. Thank you. Uh, final question before we go to the next uh, set of content, and it's a question from my colleague, uh, Bill Mason. Um, and, and in your view, what would successful data collabor collaboration in this area between employers actually look like? What would you think would be useful and might make a difference? Well, I think, I would think that there were two features. I mean, you know, I think that overall, by the way, data collaboration tends to produce something completely outside of the territory of the, the insight and analytical people, which is that organizations start looking for solutions, policy solutions together. And that's a whole different thing from what the, the data people are doing. But actually, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. If people feel that they can share their data, some, something happens in the climate that uh, breaks down the barriers that prevent policy cooperation. Uh, so I think the first thing you'd see is um, much more cooperation at the top and, you know, the policy making bit parts of organizations about what are we going to do about, you know, different kinds of issues, not, not particularly this specific, specific one we're discussing, but other issues about geography and infrastructure and so on. But in terms of the data regime, the things I, I think you would see are a much more open flow of information. And instead of ringing somebody up and saying, look, we're trying to find something out. Can you help us? Can we share some data? And it taking seven weeks just to get an answer. Somebody would come back to you in a day and say, yeah, here's how we're going to do it. And here's the in interface. And secondly, I think what you would see, I mean, my, if I had a KPI, it would be in every organization that over a period of, I don't know, six months or a year, somebody in the analytical or data or insight department would be able to say, 
we would never have known this had it not been for that collaboration. Um, and I, I, I think done properly, almost everybody is going to be in that position. Great. Thank you for that. Just before we move to the next uh, section of content, I'll just share an anecdote um, from my own experience at the Ultra Water. Uh, and we published, uh, our, we published our gender uh, pay data alongside our ethnic pay data. Uh, and I was quite stumped, uh, but also delighted at a staff meeting once. Uh, where just after we published it for the second year, um, I had a question from the audience saying, well, it's great that you're publishing the gender pay, date, pay gap data. Why has it gone up? And, and I thought that was a great sort of uh, <laughs> your own people kind of taking the data and then putting the management uh, and leadership on the spot uh, and asking us to come up with a, with a really good answer to that. Uh, I can't remember whether I did have a good answer, but we uh, we hopefully dealt with it. Okay. Let me now move to introduce uh, the next two sections of content. First of all, we have uh, Simon Foy, who is uh, Head of Intelligence uh, and Research at Leeds City Council. One of the things I've always been really impressed with Leeds uh, is the quality of data that they hold on demography and population within the city. And Simon will give you an excellent uh, presentation on what we know about uh, the changing population in Leeds. And then my colleague, Jill Mason, will talk uh, a little bit about some of the challenges that we've faced in putting out together our own workforce diversity report, uh, how we've dealt with some of the disclosure issues uh, and uh, what we're trying to achieve in the next report, which we're currently uh, working to put together. So without further ado, over to Simon's presentation. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Simon Foy from Leeds City Council, where I'm uh, Head of Policy and Intelligence. And uh, I just want to give a bit of a brief input looking at the geography of diversity across the city um, to help set the scene. Uh, I'm going to cover both the socioeconomic and demographic diversity of the city and try and set that in a little bit of context. I'm going to look at some of the patterns of inequality, particularly those driven by some of the key demographic trends and how at a very local level, some of these demographic trends can have quite a profound impact. But before I get into it, I think it's also important to, to set out the wider, broader context. Um, first, some positives. Leeds is uh, a large city with a strong and robust economy. It's seen significant growth over the last couple of decades. And although clearly there are challenges around COVID, some of the economic fundamentals remain strong. It's also important to talk when we talk to think about when we talk about our most deprived communities. They're often some of the most dynamic and often have some of the most significant potential in terms of innovation. We've also got some good practice in Leeds around engagement and collaboration. That said, even prior to COVID, we did face some stubborn long-standing inequalities across the city. Um, and the economic success the city's uh, seen over the last 20 years haven't equally shared across individuals and communities. So to start off in terms of socioeconomic context, um, the key thing that we often use is something called the Index of Multiple Deprivation, which is produced every three to five years by the ONS. And it draws on a wide range of indicators from income to the environment and weights them, but also looks at very local data and can be broken down to very small neighbourhood units of around 1,500 people or 600 households across England. Now, when you look at this uh, data at a local authority level across England, for 2019, it does paint quite a stark picture. The darker colours are the 10% most deprived, going to the lightest colours, which is the least 10% 10, 10 deprived local authorities across England. And you see a, a, a wave of local authorities, particularly across the north, but also the Midlands, which are primarily the former industrial towns and cities, which haven't fully recovered in terms of uh, inequalities since the economic restructuring of the 1980s. And that's a story well understood and known, I think. When you look at the same data for Leeds, again, it is a picture of diversity, in part exaggerated, I think, because Leeds has got quite a broad administrative boundary around it. So you've got the inner city of Leeds um, and the 
areas of deprivation concentrated to the south and the east of the city. But the city boundary also encompasses significant rural uh, and semi-rural areas, which are relatively affluent. So overall, I think in terms of socioeconomic characteristics, almost a quarter of the city's neighbourhoods now fall within the most deprived 10% nationally, with this deprivation concentrated in the inner east and the inner south, just fringing the city centre. But I think the message I would, would come mainly come from this is that we've got almost 200,000 people in Leeds living in those areas ranked the most deprived 10% nationally which out of a population of 280 odd thousand is fairly significant. Now, not everybody who lives in a deprived area is deprived and not everybody who lives in an affluent area is affluent. But again, that sense of scale is quite important when we're thinking about the diversity of the city. The second thing I want to look at is demography. Now, the last census of population, which is the kind of key benchmark when looking at data, is nearly 10 years ago now. So it's, it's not really that helpful. So we're heavily reliant on ONS forecasts and proxy indicators. And I've lifted this animation from the ONS website and it shows Leeds and England by gender and age. And what you see is that we've got an ageing population, not unlike national, but the really standout thing for Leeds is this young population, this bulge of young people. It's in large part a function that we're a university city, we've got a significant university population, but it's also a factor of our strong economy, and it's also driven in part by migration. Now, international migration has been quite an important factor in driving the economic trends across the UK and Leeds, with, I suppose, EU, EU migration being driven largely from Romania and Poland, but also migration from Southeast Asia and Africa, uh, those traditional destinations of, of migrants. When you look at the spatial plotting of migration, this is uh, population change rather, this is based on uh, ONS um, projections rather than real data. But what you see is this population growth centered again on our most deprived communities. And actually some depopulation being experienced from our more rural uh, peripheral uh, areas, primarily as a, as a function of out-migration, but also an ageing population. So this kind of, the, the interface between social and economic factors and migration is very, very clearly shown here. I think deep, deep delving even deeper, again, if you remember that the index of multiple deprivation splits uh, the areas up from the most the ten percent most deprived number one to the ten percent least deprived number ten. What this chart tries to do is examine that spread of deprivation against the population. So this chart simply plots the population of the city by age, and what you see is a large concentration of population in our most deprived communities, and it then lessens as we go on. Now, that is unusual for a large city because of housing density, the private rented sector, and people getting the first rung on the housing ladder. But it's perhaps slightly more exaggerated in Leeds, in part because we've still got a lot of back-to-back -back houses. We've got 20,000 back-to-back houses city centred in our deprived areas. The other striking thing, I think, is the concentration of young people in these areas, but also it's the single largest um, concentration of older people. And again, if you think about the future of uh, social care, um, there's a, I guess there's a view that many of our older people live in the peripheral parts of the city rather than the city centre, but that isn't actually shown to be true when you look at the data. Another way to look at the, perhaps the concentration of young people is using school census data as a proxy measure. Now, the school census is done annually, and it is what it is, what it says. It's a, it's a census of school-aged children. And what this chart does, it looks at primary school children and plots them against the index of multiple deprivation in grey. So the grey chart, grey bars, is the distribution of primary school people, children, by the index of multiple deprivation, with number one being the most deprived, number 10 the least deprived. Now, again, similarly to the broader population, there's a concentration of young people for primary school age in our most deprived communities. What the blue chart does is look at those new arrivals since the last census. So these are youngsters who've arrived in the city over the last year. And again, over half of the new arrivals are living in our most deprived communities, 
So again, some quite profound impacts of population change in our most deprived communities. And the period between 2012 and 2018 saw an increase of 30% in the 5 to 10-year-old population in our 3% most deprived communities. So some really profound changes. So in summary, I guess, for me, um, the key headlines are Leeds is a very diverse city, perhaps more so than other northern city, in part because of the accident of its administrative boundary. We also have a very young population, which is both an asset in terms of pop the population, the future pop workforce, but also a challenge in terms of skills and ed education attainment. We need to create more opportunities in terms of pay and career progression, and tackling inequality is going to be central to any sort of post-COVID recovery, not only because it limits the opportunities of individuals, but also it holds back the economy as we are not realising the full potential that the city has. Thank you. I'm Gillian Mason and I work at Yorkshire Water. My role at Yorkshire Water is Head of Organisational Development in our people function and uh, the role of data um, uh, from a people perspective is, is really, really critical for us. The customer base and the colleague base uh, needs to be representative of, of Yorkshire. So we're really, really keen to kind of increase the quality of data that we have to inform the initiatives and the strategies that we take to either serve our customers in a, in a better way or attract colleagues and, and people into our organisation that represent those communities that we serve. So in recent years, we have published, like everybody, our gender pay gap reports and took the decision uh, last year to publish uh, our report on workplace diversity that looks at our, a whole range of, of diversity and inclusion statistics, including gender, uh, age, disability, uh, ethnicity, uh, where we have it declared. So the report contains data which shows all of that, but only where our colleagues feel comfortable um, to declare it into our HR system. So. I guess overall, um, we have a really good data set for gender uh, because it's a, an easily declared piece of information uh, all the way through from recruitment. Um, and even if we have gender reassignment within the workplace, we'll adjust that accordingly, depending on the individual's wishes. So we've had quality data there. Where data starts to drop off is where colleagues have to input that data themselves, like I mentioned earlier, so that self-declaration. We moved and implemented a new HR system last year, which we hoped would improve the completeness of our data, but we're still having quite a lot of work to do. In the report last year, we stated we wanted to improve our data and be data led in all the decisions we make, whether that be for our customers or for our colleagues, and also to improve the representation of, of different diverse groups, as well as inclusion within uh, the organization, whether that was access to development, future roles, career, you know, career opportunities, etc. It didn't improve as much as we wanted it to do. Um, and I think we've got a lot more work to do in addressing some of the cultural challenges around people feeling safe and comfortable in declaring sexual orientation, uh, disability as, as prime examples. But the other challenge we've got is, is the system isn't that easy in, in adapting it to allow people to enter that information. So the new system still has work to do. Culturally, we still have work to do um, so we can make it easy culturally confident colleagues though that they feel they can declare but in the meantime we need to make use of data analytic tools which will help us I guess provide um, some of that missing data so whether it's about ethnic profiling looking at surnames to support and supplement the data out of our system but the data we do have shows many areas where we'll need to make significant improvements 
So we do significantly represent or underrepresent communities we serve. And I guess the open dialogue that we can have with uh, other large employers in the area, such as NHS trusts, local authorities, will help align those efforts to improve the diversity of our workforce, um, improve the quality of, of data through data sharing. So once we've completed that dialogue and we start to see an improvement in, in data within our HR systems through the work that our diversity and inclusion stream leads do through campaigns about what we want data for, what we'll use data, the data for that we have and what it will drive in the organisation is going to take longer, I think, than, than we thought it, it would do. Um, but all the strategy, all the policy, all the initiatives that we take will need to be more tailored. So if we look at our regional Yorkshire data that we'll take from, um, you know, external uh, sources like the census report, they're very out of date. And if we look at the communities we serve, Hull in comparison to York and York in comparison to Bradford or Sheffield is a totally different picture. So then when we look at representing colleagues in those areas that, that's, that match those communities, it, it's really, really tricky and, and it creates a bit more of a complex picture for us. I guess the overarching need for better data is so that we can create the right conditions for our colleagues. And because of that low um, reporting at the moment, um, we don't know if we're doing the right things. So we want to be data driven, we want to be data led, but are aware of the challenges we have internally, as well as some of those uh, opportunities that we've got working with other businesses on comparing, contrasting and supporting our data picture. So thanks very much for that really interesting uh, uh, exploration of how we've been putting together our data at uh, Yorkshire Water. Can I just start before the questions start coming through with a question really, which is what do you think we've learned from the data that we've put together so far? And what do you think is the most important thing we've done with it? I think um, it's actually just having that clarity, understanding who our colleagues are. And then it enables you to have a better dialogue. And I think, you know, Richard's view earlier was, was absolutely right. We can get insight and analytics, but the magic happens when you start talking about the data. 
and, and what we've actually found is our colleagues are incredibly passionate and energetic about helping. It's not a management issue. <laughs> it's an everybody issue. Um, and I think once you, you, you kind of gather people behind that, um, that's where the magic happens. So we've got really great advocates um, who volunteer as stream leads in our diversity and inclusion steering group, and they're gathering people. So as we start to talk about the data more, people have got some great ideas and initiatives that they want to lead and they want to develop themselves rather than us feeling we've got to do it all as a, as a management team, which has been lovely. Yes, it's great when you get that sort of momentum going, isn't it? And um, I mentioned earlier um, that uh, we have not got, that our, that our disability data is nowhere near as good as it should be. Uh, and uh, when we were talking about this the other day, I was really pleased to see that we've introduced a new uh, reasonable adjustments policy, uh, because I think that's a kind of, apart from the importance of getting that right in the first place, it's a sort of signal to, the, to colleagues that this matters, and therefore there is a kind of reason to be more uh, open and clear in your declaration. I think that'll take some time to, uh, to take impact, but it's sometimes it's those iconic signals, I think, that make a, that make a difference when you're trying to improve the data. Yeah, and and I think that's a really great example of where we've we've heard, you know, but we've listened and then we've done something off the back of it, um, and then you know almost co-creating those policies. We we don't know best. We live in our shoes every day, not in the shoes of all of the different colleagues that that we have. So our um, disability lead and colleagues who. Um, you know, need reasonable adjustments that are either through, you know, physically to support them or, you know, from a mental perspective to, su to support them as well. I think, I think we've still got that view that disability has to be a, a seen physical thing for the reasonable adjustment policy. But I think, you know, what, what we found through creating that policy, listening and adapting what we do, colleagues can then own that themselves. Um, so our policy and case team, our occupational health team, our disability uh, stream lead, and indeed colleagues who have used that policy, um, have said now it's known and visible. We just work together. We can advise you on what that what that needs to be. And I guess it's now what you know. So that was a really great shining example. But like I said in the video. Uh, and I guess reflecting on what Richard was saying earlier, yeah, the data's there, but it's what we do with it that, that really, really matters. So yes, we've done a one reasonable adjustment policy, but where, where next? And you know, we need colleagues to tell us that just as much as it being led by data. So mm. sometimes I think we think of data as the statistics, but actually data for us is what our colleagues are telling us too. Yes, I mean, that's really true. It isn't just the, uh, the, the, the bold demographic data, it's the qualitative data as well, which, uh, which is significant. Uh, we've had another question uh, coming through, um, which is, let me just try and read that. What objectives uh, do we need um, to drive real change in the workplace? And I guess what one of the things we might say about that is how do you, what that's really about is how you take the data and then turn that into solid objectives and policies that might actually deliver change. Yeah, and, and I think it isn't one size fits all. You know, I'm sure there are some really good generic objectives that every business could apply, um, you know, and that's how we attract, select, onboard, how that looks and feels different for different communities that we serve. So are we almost, um, using a one-size-fits-all approach and we'll always get the same colleagues that we get because we're using those same tools so I think you know there has to be an objective around actually how how you even attract what is that perception and view of you as an organization um, generally let alone coming to work for us because you've got to start with the relationship first and the knowledge and then through what does that look like? And interestingly, the, the, the COVID piece, I think another objective is that what that's done for us is shone a light on some of the areas that we need to think about setting an objective on. So we will risk assess 
um, the work that we do to keep colleagues safe and well. But do we risk assess the employment practices that we have in place to check that it doesn't mean that certain individuals wouldn't be able to access um, that development or that promotion or that role particularly? So one of the objectives where, you know, I think what you've got to look at is, is there anything that we do consciously or unconsciously that limits and restricts inclusivity? Um, and then I think the other objective for us is, is about what we're doing today, is how do we reach that point that Richard talked about earlier around the KPI? So against objectives, what KPIs do we want to set? What would, like, what would great look like for data sharing and getting all of that insight out? Because I think if we don't set that objective, we can work on our own internal objectives to, you know, freely and happily. Um, but I'd love to see a shared objective about the data collaboration and what that then impacts on for policy. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And we'll come to that in a second when we're joined by uh, Paul Connell from ODI Leeds talk a little bit about actually uh, how we might construct uh, the dashboard uh, coming out from this event today and I suspect that one one thing that uh, Paul would say was don't aspire for perfection in data um, before you publish. Um, publish uh, and then allow other people to critique it, work with you to help improve it and it's almost like kind of crowdsourcing your data integrity really. So that's about being a little bit more bold, the sky won't fall in when you do it uh, and I think in, when we're developing the dashboard, uh, we'll need a few organizations to sort of pilot it and move quite quickly. Yorkshire Water will be one of those. Um, and we're looking for other organizations to join us and to, to take the same bold approach. I think I've got one more question coming in and then we'll move to the... Right. No, we haven't got any more questions coming in. Someone was just <laughs> providing me with an instruction uh, in, block, in block capitals even I could understand and read it. So thank you for that. Uh, thanks very much, Jill. Um, I know you've got to head off shortly. We'll now uh, have a, a, not a short break, but there'll be a short um, uh, interlude while we move to the uh, a different screen. And I move 10 yards across the room, sit there and ball and have an open Q&A when we talk about the practicalities of how we're going to achieve what we're setting up to do. So thank you very much. We'll be back very shortly. Thanks, Jill. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Can you hear us? Hi. Hi, everyone. So we've got a select view of people who have uh, joined us, uh, myself and, and Richard. Um, I'll just see who's on the line. So we have, if you just shout out and let us know who, who's on the line, that'd be great. We've got six people now. I'm Let's still see. here, Trevor. Hey Trevor, how are you doing? Just can't see you at the moment. Uh, there we go, Trevor's there. Uh, people are just joining. Yeah, Zoom's doing its thing of doing a, 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 um, a slow update as everyone who's come in. So. So as people join, if you wouldn't mind turning your video on so we can see who is on the on the call, that would be grand. And then um, this is more of a wrap up at the end of the, of the day. So you might have seen um, uh, the prototype tool that myself and uh, the ODI Lease team and Tom Forth uh, have built. So that allows you to compare your data with a reasonable assessment of what uh, your place looks like. Um, so, and then we've done a little bit of a, an analysis of what, um, what a reasonable number of, uh, if you've got 25 people and the age range is between 25 and 45, what a reasonable assessment of a, um, of a diversity you could expect in your um, age. And then it allows you to say how representative you are of your, uh, your place, which I think uh, a lot of people um, sometimes uh, forget and beat themselves up. So we're just uh, admitting everyone to the Zoom room now. Okay. Fine, do we think? So, yeah. Right, let's. Um, do we think we need to leave it any longer to allow? No, no, let's just, yeah, if people just want to. This is more of a um, people are joining. We've got last one, Sue Wynn is joining. Right, okay. So, um, let me just do a quick uh, rundown of who's uh, in the Q and A session. Paul, if you don't stop, so myself, yep. uh, Richard Emmett, and Paul Connell uh, from the uh, from Leeds uh, from ODI Leeds. We have uh, Mel Taylor from Northern Gas Networks, Sue Wynn from Leeds City Council, Trevor Still, uh, Josh uh, Wilson Bailey. Hi, Josh. I'm not sure which organisation are you from. Hi, at Lee City College. Oh, hi, Josh. Who we have Yenny uh, Yavinen from uh, Yorkshire Water, Duncan uh, McIntyre from Yorkshire Water, Paul Carter, my colleague. Um, who else do we have? Uh, Alison McTrusty, who I think is uh, NHS Digital. Is that right, Alison? Yep, that's right. I was just in the middle of editing my name there, but you've seen <laughs> me to it. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, I suggest we uh, we get started, um, and I think that we can have a very open discussion actually. But I think the first question, so I'm going to put Paul uh, on the spot first straight away. But I think uh, the question we'd like to ask really is, what do you think uh, the uh, Leeds Diversity Dashboard would actually kind of look like, and where would we host it, and how would it get constructed? Yeah. yeah. What what would all what that sort of good stuff? The practicalities. Uh, practicalities. Um, so the first thing is, I think, is um, so we we built lots of dashboards um, at ODI Leeds over the over the um, uh, years. We you know we're almost six years old, and then we built a lot around COVID. I think the main thing is is um, we should build one and get it wrong, and then you can tell us um, what what it what it um, what it demonstrates. And the, the first thing is maybe to get, um, we could work with Yorkshire Water to have some data that's published and then try and present that. There's something around geography. Um, all, with all dashboards that involve geography in place, um, we need to uh, have a think about how important geography is to us. So are we at, do we want to look at ward level? Do we want to look at um, just lead city? Are we looking at city region? Are we looking at local authority geographies? So there's going to be a little bit of a to and fro about what is a meaningful geography for us and what, how does that make sense? 
we recently just put together a West Yorkshire uh, COVID dashboard, which was really important because we took the national data and presented it at a West Yorkshire level, which then allowed a whole different set of questions to be asked about comparing Leeds with Bradford, with Halifax, with uh, Huddersfield, uh, that hadn't been had before. And we got a lot of inbound conversations from people saying, oh, that's great, but I've got my own data, which shows something different. Um, but I'm not going to share that because obviously that's very important to me. Um, and it allowed us to have a conversation. Said, so, well, if, if the desk de de was wrong, you really need to publish your data. Um, and it and it does get a little bit edgy in that conversation because some people um, are um, just admitting everyone to the. Uh, a couple more people uh, joining. Uh, so, so I think there's something that there's a there's a there's something we need to do together is to look at what a meaningful geography is. Then we need to have a conversation about uh, what the meaningful data. Is. So I think there's something around gender which we can need to publish. We've got gender pay gap. We've got the. Um, I think Trevor can really help us about what means. Well, obviously, Bain is. I've heard a lot of people saying actually Bain means nothing to me. Um, you know, it's basically everything that's not white. Um, and is that meaningful or not? Um, um, and I'm quite like to be quite punchy in that, and, and um, okay. uh, maybe um, we can get some of Trevor's advice about how we might want to publish that data because um, it really, it, I don't, I'm not sure it's helpful in a lot of contexts. So there's that, um, and then um, we can maybe start saying, oh, is there something we can be more experimental about in terms of um, economic background? Uh, a lot of conversations recently about you know working class people don't succeed. So is there something in that just to start looking at? Um, and then uh, we can help by putting it on the web. Um, okay. I know GLEs can build the prototypes and then if it works, others could maybe take that on and maybe build a bit more of a, a bulletproof, uh, more permanent solution. I mean, the intersectional data is potentially very interesting uh, and rich, but I'm a great believer in uh, not uh, running uh, before we can walk and let's get some data up there and then perfect it add new uh, organizations to that data um but let's not dominate the discussion are there any call any issues that uh, colleagues on the call would like to raise or, or or contribute before we keep on chatting so we've got a question from esther there so no one is speaking at the moment can you hear myself and richard chatting I can hear you guys, obviously. Thanks. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, can hear you. Great stuff. Okay. So that, that's good. That's good that we can hear you. Um, so, uh, any uh, yeah, anything that colleagues would like to raise based on what we've been discussing this morning? Um, and what does anyone think we should do next? I think we could. Yeah, go ahead. Right, I think as Mel was looking to come in from Northern Gas Network. Hi, Mel. Hi. I mean, it, it was um, it was really just a statement of support um, as much as anything else, and um, to say that we're really um, we're really up for doing this. It's really timely for us. I, I, I do take your I do take your point earlier about not waiting for the data to be perfect. I think we were a step before that. It's you know. <laughs> We, we kind of need to pull some baseline data together. We, we're in the process of, of doing that at the moment. So we're working with an organization called um, Equal Group. I don't know if others have, have come across them to help us develop an initial, um, an, an initial baseline of, uh, of data. Um, but it will put us right at the start of this journey. So the idea that we then have it, you know, have a group that we can sort of share that with, com compare it with the data that, that, that you have identify sort of where those those gaps are um it just yeah it couldn't be better timing so we really welcome it great great thanks mel and anything we can do to help you out in that process we'd be delighted to great stuff yeah so so you wanted to um uh talk about geography if you could just uh, yes please um so i know that we did some employee mapping simon foy helped us undertake some um, uh, mapping of data from I think it was about six seven of the anchors um, and that that was interesting because um, speaks to your question about geography 
we found that um, a, a, a number of the anchors employ people from across Leeds City region and beyond but I would suggest that we need to look at least an area as large as Leeds City region um, to capture um, anything in terms of uh, geography. We also looked um, at lower super output areas in terms of um, mapping against deprivation indicators, um, which proved very helpful in terms of understanding the current position of our employees. Great stuff. Yeah. But I remember that piece of work very well, um, Sue. I thought it was very powerful, particularly in, in I think she was able to correlate um, you know, quite uh, clearly where staff of different sort of uh, uh, tiers and, and hierarchy within the organisation live and how that correlated to areas of multiple deprivation and so on. It was a really strong piece of work. I can certainly share that with ODI so they can see what we already had and if there's anything that they can take from that. Brilliant. Fantastic. And I think, is Josh coming in next? Is that right? Uh, Hi, yeah, thanks Richard. Um, yeah, I, I think probably, um, like Mel, you know, um, would like to sort of reiterate, I'm definitely really interested in this. Um, I guess one of the things for me as well is kind of looking at how we can potentially share best practice in terms of the collection of the data that you know we're kind of looking for um obviously as a lot of people have alluded to on the call and 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 the um the seminars is clearly you know gaps in data obviously uh, are quite prevalent across different organizations and i think um, certainly for me, it'd be quite useful if, if we were able to sort of put together a forum where we were able to share best practice in, in perhaps encouraging people to, um, you know, declare that information. Is there any kind of um, particular barriers people feel um, that they're experiencing, that type of thing? Okay. Um, so we'll go, we'll, we'll go to Alison McTrusty in a second about their data, but uh, ODI Leeds, there's 20 sponsors all doing data. We have a, something called the Open Data Working Group that meets roughly every month to six weeks. We could make that a, we can make one of those sessions all about diversity data, and then we'll just get a show and tell from the people who are publishing, and our team are then on hand um, to do that, um, to help you with the technology, te technical piece, pieces around that. And the way we manage a lot of this is to, to do three things. We would get a, a story blog, which we put up, um, which describes why we're doing it and why it's important. We then have a technical blog, which we would then describe how we've done it and the, the technology behind it and what we're doing. And we would probably then encourage people to publish the data in all. Um, and then we'd have a, um, as I said there, we'd have a, a repository for the data and also a repository for the code. So very simply then we all have the resources required um that the last one was just held yesterday so in another month six weeks time there'll be a, an open data working group and i on behalf of the sponsors of odi leads we'd open up that to the other uh, members of this call of the anchor network and we do a, a you know a diversity data special so hopefully that will help josh so i think the answer to your question josh is yes yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah great. thank you <laughs> that's a great question and it's one of the it's a really good kind of next step that we need yeah. to uh, to do on a very practical basis after this first session. Cool. And then um, just, um, I think, uh, do we have any other questions? I'm just checking in the chat that people's got questions. So Alison, um, at Trusty, you, you've mentioned there about, um, you've got a document there about how you share your data annually. Um, uh, maybe just tell us about that, but then also, is that data getting used? Um, because I saw a test sometimes about how useful it is. So, you know, how much use does that get data and do we need to amend things to make it more useful? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we've, we've been doing our annual workforce report for three, four years now. I can't remember, 2016, I think, four, this will be our fourth year. Um, so you can see, you can see all our kind of previous reports through that, through that link as well. Um, and just picking up on what Josh was saying, uh, we are actually at the moment in the midst of a, a, a project looking at our data and our MI internally um, because um, 
anybody knows NHS digital uh, data is kind of our bag, um, but we, we like to tie ourselves up in knots with it as well and make things incredibly complicated. So <laughs> I think ODI, you probably know us. Uh, know, we know, we experience we're, some we're of that stuff. Yeah, we're here to help. Yeah. So, so is the data so, behind that report published or just the report? Uh, uh, so there is there is some data behind it. Yeah, you've got to keep you've got to keep drilling down. So there's some kind of infographics, and then if you if you keep clicking through, you get to you get to the data, and obviously there's there's low number um, suppression and stuff applied, and all the usual usual yeah. practice stuff. Um, but um, yeah, so I think I think we'd definitely be keen to um, have some of those conversations around around declaration, around standards, um, and also just to add in. Um, in terms of pay gap reporting this year, we haven't published yet, um, but it's kind of going through our internal processes. But in addition to um, gender, we've run our ethnicity pay gap, we've also run disability pay gap as well. Um, so uh, I guess anybody working in those spaces would be really keen to have some, have some conversations about that. That's fair, but yes. I think we, we can definitely help you. Um, uh, what I'd love to do is get to the point where you publish the data first and then write the report second. Yeah, I'll take the <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. We've been uh, been working with Jill, who was on earlier on uh, our, this year's uh, workforce diversity report, and my objective is to remove the words wherever I possibly can, unless they actually uh, explain the tabulations or the data, um, because it's not an exercise in signalling how good we are. It's an exercise in showing the numbers and letting them speak for themselves. So uh, we'd be delighted to put our data alongside yours, uh, Alison and see if we could uh, put the two together as a, a founder members of the dashboard, if that was um, possible. Just a brief reflection on that, on the uh, sort of publication of, of ethnic pay gap. We did that, uh, I think last year, or maybe the year before for the first time. And I was very proud of the fact that we were doing this. Um, the odd thing was that it showed that the, that the pay gap was probably about 6%, so relatively low. Um, and because it was quite low, no one was terribly interested in it externally. Had we been publishing a figure that was 20 or 30 percent, I suspect it would have attracted a lot more attention. Doesn't mean it wasn't right to do, absolutely right it was right to do, but sometimes you get some odd results when you do uh, useful and the right thing. So um, I'm happy to, uh, to work with you on that. Yeah, yeah, we've certainly got um, from the emerging data some, some slight differences in what the data is saying and what the staff are telling us. Yeah. I think that might just be due to do with the size of the population, possibly. But yeah, be happy to have that chat. Excellent. Uh, are there any other questions or issues colleagues would like to raise? There's probably one that I'd like to point towards Paul, if that's okay, Paul. Oh, I agree. We talk a lot about we talk a lot about data as a kind of an abstract <laughs> term, and obviously, it's as omnipresent as. Uh, there's kind of religion in terms of it can, it can manifest and mean a myriad of different things. Um, but when we, when we get down to talking about diversity, obviously it moves away from the territory of operational data into potentially personal data. And I, I guess what we want to establish through this, and I think the reason everyone's on this call is, is for the same reason, to, to establish a common set of rules whereby we can we can reflect and we can compare each other's data at a level which we are all comfortable with. And obviously that means rolling up essentially raw data, be it around an individual's um, identity as a gender or a disability or ethnicity, up to a, a format in which we go, okay, this is directly comparable. We've got a common, we've got a common practice in place here that is publicly available. Is that something you, you anticipate the ODI leading on or, or, or is is that collaboration somewhere where we've just got to find the balance or the compromise collaboratively? I think that probably is collaboration Duncan but I might ask Trevor to come in at, at this point on the on the declaration point uh, and I think it's it's often about kind of finding the, the level of granularity uh, which is, and classification which is useful and I don't know how it is that you actually got to work out whether you're going too granular or not granular enough. Uh, I wonder if you might share some thoughts on that point. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem always with um, categorization is that, <clears throat> that, I mean, what you're trying to do is to compare gr groups with 
the mean, with the, you know, with the average. Um, and the problem that you have is that depending on how many groups you have, you get a whole different kind of information. So for example, if we, and, and if you've got incomplete returns, that compounds the problem. So for example, if you, um, you've got 100 employees and 80% 80, 80 of them fill in the forms that say we're this, that, and the other, 20, 20 of them don't. Um, if what you do is you then uh, categorize, use two categories, you make this binary, what you end up with mathematically is a margin of error of about of 20 percent uh, on the outcome. So the number of categories you use affects what you discover. Uh, secondly, I think that there is a rather separate and even trickier issue, which is to do with whether what people say they are is actually what you need. Um, we did, we've just done, uh, run uh, uh, an exercise for uh, health authority uh, in the southeast, <coughs> um, but I'm not telling you which one it is, um, which says, which uh, analyzed a million patient episodes. One of the things, I won't bore you with the detail of it, but one of the things that comes out of that episode is that um, they, they've rather sort of made the tick boxes a little odd, a bit complicated, but essentially, what one of the outcomes is, is that about 30% of patients with Sikh names ticked a box which identified them as white British. We've also done a separate uh, exercise uh, with a small sample of people with Turkish Cypriot names, um, of whom nearly half ticked the box white British. And what we interpret this as being is not a mistake, it is simply what people want you to think of them as. Now that's use, that's okay. That's useful if you're dealing with one to one, uh, you know. And it, what pronouns do people want to be addressed by, and that kind of stuff. But if what you're trying to do is to um, investigate and get some predictability about patterns of behaviour or vulnerability and so on, it's basically completely useless because actually what matters is not what people think they are, but what other people think they are. You most most of the time. Um, uh, so there's, a, there's some issues around that. So I've now complicated things massively, but it's a discussion which I think, uh, to be honest, this, this is the kind of group that it is most useful to air in because other people want to make it political and so on. Whereas I think what we're trying to do is to think about what gives us predictability, what is useful. Um, in terms of the numbers of categories, um, our view at the moment is very, it's pretty straightforward. Um, using origins, our technology, we can do 50, in fact, we can do 200, but usefully we can do 50. And in some cases that's useful because you can break out small groups like we do for the police. Um, if there's a scam going on against Romanians, we can break that out and identify where those people are and so on. But for the most, most purposes, uh, a, a, a division, a categorization that matches the ONS 18 categories gives you enough granularity, it also gives you comparability. Um, and that's what we, generally speaking, recommend. Excellent. Thanks, Trevor. And we go to uh, Chris, uh, who has his hand up very patiently. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. So, sorry, I've been having awful problems with technology this morning. So, uh, uh, so Chris Carvey from Lee's Teaching Hospitals. So I suppose, I'd uh, just like to say, you know, we, we're really interested in sort of uh, getting involved in this, in this, in this work. We, We've sort of gone through a sort of a spectrum of um, uh, we, we've reported data for quite some time, um, um, and uh, yeah, we we we've sort of changed our approach, and I'm not sure we've landed in the right place yet in terms of yeah. So we did used to publish masses of sort of spreadsheet and uh, huge amounts of data on our web page, and actually when we actually looked at how many people were actually looking at that data, there wasn't wasn't anybody, and the number of hits that is sort of generated in relation to that was probably all from uh, the people who put, actually put it up on the first place. So uh, we we're now at the situation of sort of trying to. Um, um, sort of identify um, um, sort of infographics detailing this sort of what we believe to be the key 
themes within the organisation and sort of say, or to, and the sort of the the big the bigger sort of challenges that we face within the organisation. But we we're really uh, would be very happy to uh, participate in this in this project as well. So again, I think we're probably at a similar place to everywhere other people as well in terms of we've got differences in terms of the quality of our data. Uh, I mean, I think we've got quite good data in relation to ethnicity um, and, uh, and some very good data in relation to gender, age, etc. Uh, sexuality less so, disability data is really bad. So, uh, uh, but yeah, that's sort of one of our uh, equality objectives for this year in terms of um, and moving forward in terms of trying to improve that. But like I said, we're really happy to get involved in the, in the project. That's brilliant, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, it sounds like your sort of uh, your data profiling is very similar to ours in terms of where the, where the strengths are and where the gaps are. So it would be yeah. great to collaborate and bring that together. And I guess if you if you think about and there's already a really good collaboration between uh, teaching hospitals and Leeds City Council around employment initiatives uh, yeah. in LS1, uh, which is really positive. So. Uh, in terms of where we go next with this initiative, I sort of in my mind, I have welcome to suggestions. Uh, I figured that we'd get a kind of cohort of what you might call early adopters, uh, four or five of us who would um, figure out how to do this, come up quickly with a sort of prototype that we could aspire to, um, uh, and, uh, and get cracking um, in terms of um, getting stuff published and deal with some of the um, pitfalls and issues on the way. Our own experience of working with ODI leads has been that um, there's often quite a reluctance to publish operational data, which we've done quite a bit of, um, on the basis that it's not perfect, um, someone owns it, uh, and the sky might fall in uh, if you publish it and allow people to look at it. Uh, the truth is, of course, that none of those things actually matter very much. Uh, fewer people look at it uh, than you would imagine, which is a shame, um, but the thing to do is just to get it out there, work to make it better, and then collaborate with other people to see how you can make it useful. So my proposal will be to take forward today uh, and set up a small working group of, of if you like, the, um, the early adopters, the advocates, uh, and I'd suggest Leeds City Council, teaching hospitals, NHS Digital, ourselves, or anyone else who wants to participate in that, kind of get together um, and uh, have an, an initial discussion about uh, what the, you know, and set ourselves an aspirational time scale of getting something published inside six months. I was going to say 12, but then I suddenly thought six sounded better, so we'd go for that. <laughs> Does that sound like uh, something that we could all sign up to? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'll, I think I mentioned this on a previous call, um, I'll, I'll need some input just for our, um, our data protection impact assessment process, um, but I'm sure that's all readily available for us to just drop into our templates. Excellent. Um, that's something that we'll all have to, to deal with. Uh, we, Yorkshire Water, we embarked on the open data uh, initiative at the worst possible time, which was just when GDPR was coming into place and the whole place had a sort of very risk averse attitude uh, to publishing anything, so which meant that one of my colleagues um, stayed up all night um, uh, depersonalizing uh, 75 million lines of already depersonalized data. Yep. So um, that was a not exactly a useful thing to do itself. Okay. Um, uh, final word, maybe Trevor, is anything, uh, any piece of advice as we set out on this uh, initiative that you've given? Well, I, I, I'm d delighted to, to have heard everything that's been said today, though. Uh, forgive me, Richard, because of my incompetence, I may have missed uh, a bit at the beginning. But what I think is much most important here is that um, not just the institutions, but the individuals that I'm hearing on this call are, bluntly speaking, quite rare in public life, in that everybody here is, is obviously keen to be led by data rather than um, the, trying to find data that reinforces, you know, an existing narrative. Um, and uh, in our work, all the things, what we're discovering again and again, every day, is that actually, not only does that tell you new 
that approach to telling you things. It actually opens up all sorts of possibilities about how we serve people, how we help them, how we make sure that they understand, particularly in public service, but also the private sector, um, how we understand what they want and what will, um, you know, make make things work for them. So I, I, I'm really encouraged by this, and anything that we can do to be supportive, um, we want to do. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Paul, oh, anything from an ODI lead uh, perspective before we wrap up? Um, well, the, the, I think just join in. It's going to be fun. Um, and um, um, join in my, uh, my ambition to uh, kill all reports and replace them with uh, simple data. So um, let's forget writing reports and start uh, publishing data and, and, and building real tools. So that's my last thing, yeah. Thanks for that. We do need some words. I'm not going to kill them all. Yeah, yeah, but most okay. of them anyway, but yeah. Great. Well, thanks very much for participating in this morning. I'd like to thank colleagues here at ODI Leeds, uh, particularly uh, Amy, Catherine and Grace, who've done a fantastic job in making the tech work uh, and keeping us all going. That's been brilliant help. And thanks to you all for your enthusiasm, uh, enjoyment, and above all commitment to actually do something that might be practical, that might be useful. Uh, the content will be available through a uh, website uh, and we'll send around the URL uh, later. So you'll be able to share that with your colleagues or anyone else who can't participate in the call today. Uh, again, thanks to Sue and colleagues at the Leeds City Council for their commitment to making the Anchor Network uh, make such a difference uh, across all our workforces. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the day and indeed the weekend. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>